It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woohoo! Welcome, welcome. Feels like it's been a while. Thank you, audience, fake audience. Thank you, fake band. And let me get the real audience opened up here. There you guys are. Hello, real audience. How are you? Um, yeah, we didn't do a show last week because I was slammed getting ready to go out of town. I went to the uh, Hawaii Songwriting Festival. They, it used to be called the Kauai Music Festival, and that organization still runs it, but they moved it to the Big Island of um, the Big Island and did it on the Kona Coast. And it was wonderful to be there. What a bunch of great people. And I want to give a shout out to Charles, Joni, and Julia Brotman um, for doing a great job uh, of putting it all together. This was their first year of, of actually running it. They've all worked at it before and, and been on the board, but did a great job. Um, I flew out on Wednesday and then came home on a red eye Saturday night and... Uh, I'm one of those guys that if I'm on an airplane uh, and there's a germ floating around anywhere on that plane, it seems to find me and I seem to have gotten a little bug. So I'm dizzy today. I feel like uh, I'm doing this. I'm, uh, I'm spinning. It feels like I just got off a uh, uh, an ocean liner. <laughs> That's an old school term. You know what I mean? A cruise ship. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here and glad to be doing a show. Um, are you guys getting me? Uh, let's see. Chat room guys, let me know if you can hear me okay. Actually, okay, the volume is there. All systems are go. Um, people are talking about Lansing, Michigan at the moment. Oh, yeah, there's a hello, Michael, from uh, Jesse. So uh, you guys have me. All right. Peter Rahill says he's having Hawaiian punch. Does that count? They still make Hawaiian punch. <laughs> um, so it was a great weekend. And uh, at some point, probably, I don't know, a week or so ago, uh, I can't remember the circumstance, but I was thinking, oh, I know what it was. Somebody uh, has emailed me a couple of times or posted on the forum saying something about I want to hear more about uh, successful taxi members that live outside of the United States. And um, I don't know that I could do an entire taxi TV on just that. Uh, I actually did a show, or not a show, a, a letter um, in the taxi newsletter either, I think it was last month in the questions and letters column down at the bottom, uh, addressing that issue, rattling off a whole bunch of, of foreign members that have been successful. But uh, I would say probably 20% of our members are outside of the United States from countries all over the world. I think something like 90 different countries. Anyway, Adonis Electris has been a member for, I don't know, five, six, seven years, something like that. As a matter of fact, I think of him every week when I look in the camera and I see the statue of Venus that uh, he sent me. He lives um, on the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. And, uh, oh, did I say East Mediterranean today? I think it's the Western, I don't know. Anyway, he lives <laughs> on the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. Um, Cyprus, uh, uh, it's often associated with Greece, although I don't think it's technically, it's its own republic and actually not part of Greece, but somehow connected to Greece in some way. Anyway, uh, Adonis has become a great friend over the years, and I could not be more proud of him. He's done quite well for himself, and living on this uh, relatively small island, I would guess probably like 8,000 miles away from L.A., hasn't seemed to uh, affected his uh, ability to be successful at all. Um, and I was, so I was thinking about him in the context of that discussion with the guy who wanted to know about successful members outside the U.S., and at some point I said, hey, Adonis, send me uh, 10 cues that I can play on Taxi TV. Uh, and funny enough, while I was at the Hawaii Songwriters thing, people kept coming up to me going, what's a cue? You keep talking about cues. I moderated a couple of the larger panels and people would say, what's a cue? And, and I realized that 
A lot of songwriters don't know what a cue is, um, unless you are in the business of making instrumental stuff for film and TV, you may not know. Uh, and basically, the short, easy version of it is that a cue is a relatively simple, uncomplicated um, piece of instrumental music that is typically, uh, there are cut down versions that are shorter, like five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, but generally speaking, they're like 30 seconds up to maybe a minute and a half, two minutes, maybe a little over two minutes. They're not very long. Generally speaking, they have short intros, sometimes no intro at all. Um, they generally stick to one um, motif throughout, um, generally. All these are generalities. Uh, you know, everything is subject to change and, and rules are meant to be broken. But I'm speaking in gen generalities. Um, I can't think straight today because seriously, as I'm looking at the camera, everything's spinning around right now. So, um, and they tend to stay on that one theme throughout. Sometimes they have a B section, but typically the A section, which is the thing that goes throughout the whole thing, is kind of like the chorus. And uh, instrumentation usually starts out kind of light, then builds up in another four or eight bars, then builds up more, and then drops down, breaks down, and then builds back up, and then eventually breaks down again, builds back up, um, comes to a crescendo and then a buttoned or a stinger ending, meaning that it doesn't fade. It ends, generally speaking, on the root chord. Uh, and there's a ta da and it just rings out. It makes it easy for video editors to use it, to cut between scenes and stuff. So a lot of times, I, I've probably mentioned this on the show a hundred times, but a lot of times it's not even a music supervisor putting um, cues into reality TV. Very often uh, the supervisor will give a hard drive with uh, you know, maybe 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 pieces of music that are already pre-approved, pre-cleared, and the video editor will actually put them in the show. So sometimes you have non-musical people cutting pieces of music into the show. Um, and they want it to be easy. Uh, so I learned something, I'm sure I've heard this before at the Road Rally uh, on a panel, but one of the panelists that I had on, uh, I think the film and TV panel that I was moderating uh, this past weekend, said something really simple but profound. And that is that when whoever, I can't remember if the panelist was a man or a woman, whoever it was said, when I get a piece of music, and I look at the waveform, uh, like you might see on SoundCloud, and the waveform is just flat all the way across, basically. Um, they don't see a lot of peaks and valleys. They don't even bother listening to it. They just move on. And the reason is that they want the peaks and valleys. They want those dynamics. They want easy edit points that they can chop up the music to make it fit the scenes. They don't build the show around the music. They put the music into the show. So, I thought that was cool, and just remember that when you're um, composing instrumental stuff. If the waveform looks like a plateau and not like peaks and valleys, you're probably hurting yourself. So without any further ado, I want to get to some of Adonis's music. Um, and he sent, was kind enough to send me great notes uh, on each, each piece. So the first piece that we're going to listen to is called... Let's get this fired up. Okay. Uh, the first piece that we're going to hear, if I can get this thing working, is, whoops, it's called Balkan Dance, B-A-L-K-A-N, like the Balkans, Balkan, um, the Balkans an island? I don't know. It's part of the world. Um, and the genre is world slash ethnic music. And Adana says, for authenticity's sake, I hired a friend of mine who plays ethnic clarinet to perform on this cue. A wise choice, in retrospect, because no sample library in the universe can emulate this kind of playing. Notice the edit points and the general less is more feel of the cue. Um, you'll also notice that it's got something uh, that you'll see referred to in taxi listings every now and then, which is non-lyrical vocals. Uh, when they want an instrumental, they don't want lyrics, but uh, it's not unusual that you hear AO or Oz or some sort of vocal sample or maybe a, a choral or choir sample 
um, used more like an instrument than actual vocals. So this has some non-lyrical vocals in it. Um, so without any further delay, let me play Balkan Dance from Adonis Electris. <laughs> Nice set up point. Yikes. <laughs> All right, and that was Balkan dance. And somebody, uh, let's see, was it Mary Band said the Balkans are a peninsula, Michael, consisting of the former Yugoslavia, Albania, Greece, and part of Bulgaria, if I'm not mistaken. I hope you're not, because now it's forever out there on the internet. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, I think what makes that cool, first of all, not that many people cranking out that type of music. And while it may not be something that's going to get a lot of different uses, you can bet that anytime somebody is looking for ethnic music for, from that part of the world, let's say it's a episode of a show like Homeland or somewhere where they're going to send spies off to a foreign land and they need music that would be playing during a car ride or maybe in the background of a hotel lobby uh, maybe in a restaurant or bar, um, that's going to be it, right? <laughs> it's certainly going to be a contender. And I totally agree with Adonis that bringing in somebody to play an actual real clarinet on top of the track totally distracts you from the fact that the rest of the track was probably built uh, almost certainly using MIDI. Um, anytime you can do that, that's an awesome thing to do. It makes it feel more real. Um, again, you heard the non-lyrical vocal in there. So that was just in there like once or twice. And the editor may hear that and go, ooh, I like that. I, you know, that's going to make the scene better. Well, easy enough to take that section of the song because it had some great edit points in it and just use that section. So there you go. All right. Uh, any questions? How long was that cue? You know, he didn't put times on it. Um, let me do a quick fast forward on it, see how long it was. I think it was a couple of minutes. Yeah, it looks like it was about a minute 45. Um, Okay, so, and now we're moving on to a cue called Dangerous Streets, which Adonis co-wrote with another taxi member from Nashville, I believe. Um, his name is Bruce Brown, um, and Adonis says this one is Southern Tension, and Bruce Brown is a phenomenal guitar player. He provided stellar guitar, guitar work while I wrote the percussion, bass, and the pads, uh, synthesizer pads. A cue like this one has many peaks and valleys, thus providing the editors and music supervisors plenty of material to choose from. 
So again, th there's that topic of if, if your stuff, if the waveform looks flat and it sounds flat and it's just kind of flat all the way through, not that exciting. Um, but if they can visually see the peaks and valleys in the waveform, then they know, the editors know it's going to be easy to cut. So dangerous streets, southern tension cue, and let's have a listen. I wonder what a northern tension cue sounds like. dynamic. Again, peaks and valleys. Easy to cut this. mentioned that about a year ago um, Adonis sent me an email and he said dear Michael I know how much you love reading about placements that taxi members get on film and TV so I thought I'd put a smile uh, write and put a smile on your face this is a year ago my last BMI statement was bursting with taxi related placements uh, Nitro Circus on MTV Robin Big on MTV the real world explosion MTV um, America now Animal Planet America's Next Top Model. He's at a thousand plus placements so far on America's, uh, and that was a year ago, America's um, Next Top Model. Uh, Duck Dynasty, a year ago, he'd had 800 plus placements on that so far. Uh, Bar Rescue, it's a Brad Brad World, um, Chef Roble and Company, Dukes of ha Huggle, never heard of that one. Uh, Restaurant Redemption, Hollywood Treasure, Here Comes Honey Boo Boo, a classic, uh, Million Dollar Decorators, Real Vice Miami, Shark Week, Swamp Wars, Snapped Killer Couples, um, Toddlers and Tiaras, and he says most of the above earned royalties in Canada, Finland of all places, Mexico, Norway, UK, and France. My work ethic is the same. Um, uh, he didn't say this. I'm, I'm inserting in some brackets. Uh, work ethic is the same as it's always been. Then he says hard work. Um, but all these wonderful gigs came about from taxi forwards and I'm assuming relationships that he made at the road rally. Uh, eternally grateful Adonis. Um, anyway, uh, that was a year ago. Um, gee, I wonder how much more he's had in that last year because people that are like Adonis that work that hard generally, you know, things kind of ramp up. Um, okay, so now we're moving on to... Uh, Q number three, which is called Hackers. Um, and notice the titles, okay? Uh, what was the title of the last one? What was that? Um, Dangerous Streets. 
Yeah, that cue sounded like something bad was going to happen walking down an alleyway or a dark street late at night somewhere in the south. This one's called Hackers, so I'm guessing that it sounds kind of scientific, maybe? Um, or techie sounding, and it was co-written with Chuck Schlachter, who has been a longtime taxi member. Any of you who go to the road rally probably know Chuck. He lives in Nashville. Um, used to be just like a, a jazz guy uh, and has really branched out and been quite successful. And uh, anyway, this is a suspense, suspense slash tension cue. And Adama says, I first met Chuck on the taxi forum and then at the road rally. We've been collaborating for a while now. We recently produced a 12-track suspense uh, tension CD. This cue features Chuck on all the synth melodies slash pads and myself on percussion. Notice the abundance of edit points in the cue and the relentless feeling of suspense and tension. There's a lot going on, but never enough to interfere with the dialogue or take away from the visuals. Editors and supervisors love those attributes. Yes, they do. So let's have a listen to Hackers. band can't hear a thing. Can the rest of you guys hear this okay? I'm assuming so because I'm not seeing any other uh, people talking about that in the chat room. So that was called Hackers and, and that was clearly a suspense or, or tension cue. Um, very simple and I wrote, I made a note while I was listening to it. Um, I remember that uh, Adonis said that Chuck is playing, Chuck Schlachter is playing all the synth melodies and pads and that it's Adonis on percussion. You could almost just take the percussion and have that be a cue. Um, I thought the percussion was really kind of cool in that. And, uh, you know, normally these things, ooh, I'm going to get to that question about how, how important is the title. Um, okay, so I'm going to cut that other thing short because I want to address this before it scrolls off the page. I think titles are critically important. Um, you want them, it's, there aren't a lot of cues that will work for five or 10 different types of scenes. Generally, you're better off writing cues that are attention cue or, um, oh, I'm trying to think of some other kind of cue, you know, like a, 
uh, a happy cue, um, a positive cue, um, could be a quirky cue. There are all these different kind of cues. And yes, uh, you want to have titles that when the editor is looking at a list of 100 cues um, in a, under a specific genre, and they see something that sounds that the, the title is actually descriptive of the music, that solves their problem. As a matter of fact, um, the, next, the next cue I'm going to play you is called Passage of Hope. This is one that Adonis um, qualifies as uplifting positive pop rock. This cue has become a mainstay in the CBS daytime award-winning series Lucky Dog. The faster, triumphant part of the cue has been placed at the end of almost every episode in the series. Even though the music works well for the happy ending uh, of those episodes, and I'm not going to touch that happy ending stuff, um, I do believe the cue was initially chosen because of its title, he says in all caps. So there you go. Passage to Hope. You can almost hear what that is going to sound like. The title of the cue is sometimes just as important as the music because it's the first thing that will make it stand out from a pile of candidate cues. The editor slash supervisor will read the title and think, hmm, this might work. If the cue works, the search will end right there. Absolutely right. So in answer to, oh, it's already scrolled off the page. Uh, I think it was Paul Howes, yep, that asked that. Um, I can't say enough about good titles. So let's have a listen to Passage to Hope. And I'm going to go make it a little cooler in here while it's playing. <laughs> All right, so that was clearly a great example of uh, the title telling you what you're going to hear, Passage to Hope. Um, just personal opinion on my part, but I think that, that could be two different cues. The the front part of it, it's funny, he mentions that the back half gets used in almost every episode of Lucky Dog on CBS, which is probably a really nice back end because that's a broadcast uh, network. Um, and it's almost like two cues. It's got a pretty long intro for a cue, and, and the intro is quite different from the back half of the cue. The back half being, well, that's why he calls it Passage to Hope, because the back half is clearly triumphant and hopeful sounding, um, and, and the front half is kind of thoughtful and introspective sounding. Um, personally, I, I think that the the high register fiddle on the front half is might be a bit of a turnoff, um, because it's very, it's in a very high register. And if you had that underneath any um, dialogue, it might be distracting. But, uh, you know, that's really up to the editor or the music supervisor. It depends on the circumstance, whether or not that matters. But the back half of that thing, it just makes you feel good. It gives you a sense of, like, pride, accomplishment, hope for the future. And lo and behold, it's called Passage to Hope. Um You know what? I'd like a link to the music used on the shows. Okay, let me give you a link because Adonis was nice enough to put all the music from this show 
on his SoundCloud. Um, so if you go to soundcloud.com slash Adonis, A-D-O-N-I-S underscore Electras, A-L-E-T-R-A-S. Um, under, yeah, just go to soundcloud.com slash Adonis underscore Electras. And he has the file, um, it's called Taxi TV, June 2015. So all these tracks that you're hearing right now are on there for your listening pleasure after the show. Um, and you can also go to Ustream and watch the archive, and you can also watch it on YouTube as well by tomorrow. Um, so there you go, on the Taxi YouTube and Taxi Ustream. Um, but I love the fact that he talks about the editor slash supervisor will read the title and think this might work. And if the queue works, the search will end right there. That's right. So there could be 20 pieces that are all being considered um, that are all on that list. But if your piece is number three, or maybe if your piece is all the way down at the bottom, but the editor scans the list and sees Passage to Hope, and they're thinking, oh, this is great. This is somebody getting out of rehab, let's say, <laughs> in a uh, reality show. And they're getting out of rehab and they walk out the door and their family is there to greet them and they're so proud of them for finally being clean and sober. Passage to Hope, I'm interested. I'm going to go listen to that one first. And if it works with the picture, that's it. Everybody else is toast because you had the better title. And in this case, I think Adonis has a great title. So there you go. There you go. Um, let's now listen to... This one is called... Pluto fight. <laughs> I wonder if that's Pluto the Disney dog getting into a fight and getting his snout smacked around. Um, it's an epic hybrid trailer. Epic trailer music with hybrid elements is in big demand these days. Yes, it is. Trailer music cannot exist without edit points, so I made sure to add lots of them. Big percussive toms are a must, as is a pro quality reverb unit, and he used a lexicon in this case. I wonder which lexicon. Um, God, I had... What was it? Oh, I had one of the first Lexicon, I think it might have been the first Lexicon digital reverb unit back in like 1977, 78. Um, it was a Lexicon 224, and I love that thing. Boy, do I wish I had that now. Um, the bass sound needs to cut through, so choosing the right bass sounds is a must. So again, this is called Pluto Fight. It's an epic hybrid trailer, and let's have a listen. That was called, whoops, got to go back now, <laughs> wrong page. 
Uh, that was called Pluto Fight, an epic hybrid trailer. And somebody asked, what does hybrid mean? Does that mean they can be used as a trailer or as a queue? No, hybrid means that it combines a couple of different genres. Um, typically, uh, like orchestral combined with electronic stuff would be a hybrid. Um, orchestral combined with rock guitars would be a hybrid. So that's what a hybrid is. Um, uh, I saw something else go by. Okay, I missed it. Something rolled off the page already that I wanted to answer. Um, oh, Martin Frog made a comment that I thought was a great idea. And he says he likes to compose to titles. So why don't you guys try this as an exercise? I would do it a few times. And that is watch an episode of one of your favorite TV shows and make a note of a certain type of scene and what kind of music they use in there. So... Um, let's say you're watching, I hate to say it, the Kardashians. Uh, <laughs> they use an awful lot of music in, they, in that show and they use a lot of taxi member music. So let's say you're watching the Kardashians and so many episodes of the Kardashians have a scene where they're in the kitchen because let's face it, the kitchen is where people tend to congregate in almost any household. And uh, they'll be in the middle of some discussion and it turns into a little spat where egos flare and uh, they get into a, a snippy little argument and the two people in the kitchen go their separate ways and then they immediately cut to the uh, person standing there or sitting against the backdrop saying do you believe what a biatch courtney was i can't believe that she's not going to go skiing with us even though she's the one that had the idea to go skiing blah 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 okay what kind of cue would that be well that would be a, a tension cue but what if you called it Kitchen tension. And maybe kitchen tension could also work for, um, if it's written well, it could work for one of those uh, chef competitions where they're prepping stuff, trying to beat the clock and beat the other people on food TV. Or it could be used uh, in the Kardashians where they've got tension going on in the kitchen. So pick a scene, pick a scenario, Think of what kind of cue they use, write a title, and then sit down and compose to the title. And thank you for suggesting that, Martin. I think that's really, really good. Um, Mary Ban says, realize my new phone might be taking away from my Wi-Fi connection. Put it on airplane mode, and now I can hear Michael talking. <laughs> well, there you go. I got a new phone. First one in seven years. <laughs> I had my old phone for seven years. Um, <laughs> I, I won't even comment. Anyway, I just got a uh, Samsung, what is it, 6S Edge. And so far, I like it, but you need a PhD to use all the stuff that comes in there. Pretty amazing phone. Do you know that current contemporary cell phones um, or smartphones have more computing power than a Cray supercomputer of just 10 years ago had? A multi-million dollar Cray supercomputer is equivalent to today's smartphones. Mind-blowing. Um, Brad Ro Roseboro likes my idea. Well, actually, I stole the idea from Martin Frog, so uh, thanks to him. Okay. Uh, Mary Band <laughs> had a phone for eight years. Wow, somebody beat me. Um, okay, how am I doing on time? Doing okay. Okay, we are now moving on to, um, I'm going to talk about this for a second. This next one is a quirky hip-hop cue. It's called Quirky Licious, which is a pretty good title. Um, doesn't tell you it has anything to do with hip-hop, though, but it does tell you it's quirky. Um, and Adama says, hip-hop has been and still is a genre that works really well in reality TV shows. So is quirky hip-hop. As always, the title of the cue speaks volumes for what the editor slash supervisor is about to hear. This particular cue has been played countless times in the MTV show Catfish. Hip hop always calls for the freshest beats to give cues the most dope vibe, vibe possible. So uh, I want to talk about hip hop for a minute. We're constantly getting requests for hip hop. Um, and, and when a lot of our members were doing uh, instrumental stuff for Oprah's show for years, 
uh, they coined a phrase called Oprah hop, which meant basically hip hop that was made for TV that really didn't sound like authentic hip hop from the hood. And, and frankly, the kids that are making the awesome, really, truly authentic hip hop in the hood are using a bunch of illegal samples and people in the industry are scared to death to use that stuff because they don't want to get nailed for uh, improper use, um, copyright infringement on using a, a sample that shouldn't be in something. And so they tend to shy away from that. And they go with what I jokingly say is 55 year old white guy hip hop. And it works, and it, a ton of it gets used on MTV and all the reality shows. So here is Quirky Hip Hop, uh, the song title again, or the track title is called Quirky Licious. Let's have a listen. never know when to press the audience button. Okay, that was actually the end. I got faked out like three times. Um, and that again was called Quirky Licious, Quirky Hip Hop from Adonis Electris. Uh, guitar Guru Mike has, has a question. I'm hearing a wide uh, diversity of genres here, Michael. Uh, do you think it's better to produce a variety of genres or one specific genre, especially as it pertains to film and TV placements? Start out with whatever is your strength. Master that use that to get in the door and have people love you, respect you, and want more music from you, and they will inevitably ask you, what else do you have? And you should be quietly working in the background to uh, be quietly working to develop other genres. And you know what? Get out of your comfort zone. Uh, there are so, so, so many members that I've heard from over the years that think that they are a rock specialist and uh, they end up doing hip hop. Um, oh gosh, what's his name? Stephen Baird from Jacksonville, Florida. He was a rock guy trying to, I think, get a record deal or pitch songs to other rock artists, if memory serves correctly. And he took a shot and, and made a piece of hip hop years ago, like four or five years ago, and sent it in. And it got forwarded from taxi, got picked up by a library, ended up in a TV show. And the library said, do you have any more hip hop? And now he makes a really enviable living. Uh, he does many genres now, but it all started with hip hop because he was willing to try and get out of his comfort zone. And you know what? The roadmap is there. All you have to do is listen to what is being used in TV shows going, okay, so what are the elements of that hip hop track that I hear in the Kardashians or Catfish or whatever? And make a little list of the instrumentation in there. Um, note the tempo. Um, how much reverb does it have or not have? Um, does it have a faded ending? Probably not. Probably has a button or a stinger ending. And just know that whatever you're listening to in the context of the show, it's extremely rare that you're going to hear the entire piece. It's probably a cut down or an edit, um, you know, to fit the scene. But just generally speaking, cues should be bare minimum of 30 seconds long, probably longer. They generally run 30, 60, 90 um, maybe even two minutes or two and a half minutes long um, and have, again, lots of great edit points as you heard in that one. Um, 
Okay, it depends how long the tail is. Okay. Um, all right, this next one. Um, I actually, uh, I, this one is called Soul Search. Soul, like S O U L, not the sole of your shoe. Soul Search. Um, and I thought, man, you, you could take that a couple of ways. Is it a piece of soul music and so it'll play on words? Um, or is it soul searching music? So I'm going to play it for you and then we'll talk about that. Um, I also made a note. Uh, there's something about this track that I want to see if you guys pick up on it. Um, something that I think could be improved. Um, and it, to me, it sticks out like a sore thumb. And I'm curious to see if you guys get it. Or maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. You know, I've been wrong a lot. Um, also notice that the hook comes in at a minute 29, give or take a second. And that's that. Um, okay, here we go. This is Soul Search. And it's an acoustic uh, track. Oh, that's right. It's got a long intro. All right, nobody said it. Uh, I think that one of the guitars, that the rhythm guitar sounded like the B string was a little out of tune to me um, on the strummy rhythm part. Maybe I'm nuts. Uh, okay, a couple of questions have flown by that I want to address. Russell said something about Michael. He said Q should be up to 30 seconds. I think I said, maybe I misspoke. Like, a, if you weren't here for the beginning of the show, I took a red eye home from Hawaii on Saturday night. I was at the Hawaii Songwriters um, Festival, and I took a red eye home, barely got any sleep uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning, didn't sleep on the plane at all. And I woke up today, and I feel like I'm on a cruise ship. I mean, it's just like seasickness. <laughs> I'm definitely, maybe I've got an ear infection going on. I don't know, but I'm stupid and dizzy. So um, I could have misspoken. But what I was saying is, I don't, you know, unless something is cut down to less than 30 seconds, generally cues are 30 seconds or longer, um, often 90 seconds, often two minutes, um, often two and a half minutes. When it gets up into, you know, like three minutes, four minutes, then it's song length. Uh, and then somebody else said the they're starting to see listings that are talking about instrumentals. And... and I think the question was, what's the difference between an instrumental and a, and a cue? Aren't they both? They are both instrumentals, okay? Um, 
although some people refer to songs, people, I think the word cue is inappropriately used when people refer to songs. Uh, I know that a lot of video guys and or show producers will say, uh, give me a, a cue right there that's about falling in love and what they mean is a song. Um, but cues and instrumentals are both instrumental, no vocal, okay? This is my opinion, and uh, like I said at the beginning of the show, these are generalities. Nothing is true 100% of the time. In my world, instrumentals are only instrumentals, no vocals, unless it's like an instrumental vocal choral pad or something. Um, and a cue is also an instrumental. The difference is that, generally speaking, when they're asking for full-length instrumentals, they want something that is constructed or arranged more like a song, where it has an intro, a verse section, um, maybe even a pre-chorus, um, and then a chorus section. So it's basically like a song, but without a vocal. Uh, and you got to remember, not everything is film and TV. Um, a lot of times we get listings from record labels now where they want instrumental tracks that an artist could lay top line over. So, But going back to the film and TV context, um, sometimes they will ask them very specifically when they are calling us or emailing us with a listing. And we say, are you looking for cues or instrumentals? And they'll say instrumentals. And we say, so like an instrumental, like a song without a vocal? Yes. So you want something that's like two to three minutes long, maybe three and a half, maybe even four minutes long, although that would seem rare to me. Um, and uh, they say, yes. So I want something that is like a song. And, and I think what's happening is that they want something that sounds like a current chart hit that you would hear on the radio, whether it's a country song or it's EDM or pop dance, whatever the genre is. But it sounds like a current radio hit, but doesn't have a vocal. Now, I'm not entirely sure I, music supervisors know the difference i'm not entirely sure that a lot of video editors know that um, distinction or that a lot of show producers know that distinction but so we really spend a lot of time kind of you know asking them those questions in some cases educating them uh, as to the difference between the two so that we're getting the best possible um, instructions if you will um, or direction for you guys to make your submissions so I hope that clears that stuff up. Um, let me scroll back down now and see what I've missed. Holy crap. Um, um, Vicki Courtney says, the last track didn't have a lot of edit points. It, it's maybe a little tough with something that's a little more legato and floaty in the uh, acoustic instrumental realm, a little harder to put in edit points, but certainly not impossible. Um, Michael should write a book with the lingo and call it the Taxi Black Book. Um, I am currently, uh, I just did some editing this morning on a glossary of terms for our website. Um, but of course, every time I think I'm done with it, I find another term I want to add to it. So we might make it a living document that people can submit um, stuff to Taxi and we'll proof it, edit it, uh, and then include it in the glossary. But that is coming to a website near you soon. Um, yeah, you know, the words cues, cue and tracks are somewhat in, inappropriately interchangeable and often misused, I believe. Um, there are plenty of people in the industry that say, you know, give me a track with a female vocal on it. To me, a track means instrumental. Um, a song has a vocal on it. But people say, Give me a track with a female vocal about driving in the car. Um, so there you go. Uh, Mary Band or is asking the question, um, are cues a good way to break into libraries, film and TV? Absolutely. I think it's the smartest way to go. Um, Bob LaGrasso wants to know how many dispatch people are on here. Um, Yeah, somebody just said Dean's book, meaning Dean Crepain's book. Um, oh, gosh. Do I have it? I think it might be out on loan. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, 
what is Dean's book called? Can somebody please tell me? Um, something about a cue. I can't remember. Uh, and it's funny because in Dean's book, he actually talks about songs um, kind of under the, the heading, heading of cue. So um, Dean Crepain is, is one of our more successful taxi members, and he's multi-genre, multi-instrumental, um, is a great singer, great writer, great player, great producer, and an incredibly great human being. And he wrote a book, um, Demystifying the Cue, which I think everybody should own. It's Demystifying the Cue. Uh, it's available on Amazon, and I highly recommend it. Um, I can't say enough about him uh, or the book. Um, okay. Not <laughs> demystifying DQ. That would be Dairy Queen. And there's nothing mysterious about Dairy Queen. It's fat, sugar, and calories in the best possible form. Um, okay, moving on. Oh, I want to talk about the last one. The title was called Soul Search. Remember I said you could take it either way. Is it a soul song? Um you know, like R&B soul uh, kind of thing um, with a little twist on the name? Or was it about soul searching? So I made a note that I want to recommend to Adonis that he changes the title of that one to Searching My Soul. That way, if you're an editor and you're looking for, uh, you know, somebody, there's a scene with somebody sitting, you know, on a little mound of sand with wispy grass looking out at the ocean, trying to decide which path to take in their life. I'm going to be attracted to a song or a cue called Searching My Soul. So I, I would change that one so that there's no confusion. Um, okay, the next one is called Super Fit. Um, it was co-written with Pedro Costa, who has become kind of a taxi superstar in his own right in the last two or three years. Um, I've met him several times at the Red Rally. Great guy um, from Toronto, I believe, Canada. Uh, a. Um, the genre in this one is electronic dance music, EDM, and um, Adonis says EDM is not a genre that I'm very familiar with. Not my A game at all. So in an attempt to nail a pitch, I put a shout out to my taxi road rally friends for help. Luckily for me, Pedro Costa offered his expert touch and the queue eventually got signed to a great library. The vocal licks are all sampled, but that's totally okay for this genre. Uh, getting the correct balance between the kick drum and the bass is paramount in EDM, and Pedro did an outstanding job on that end, and then some. Uh, so let's have a listen to Super Fit, which was co-written by Adonis Electris and Pedro Costa. <laughs> Super Fit, co-written with uh, Adonis and Pedro Costa. Um, as I was listening to it, it reminded me of the Kia commercials. I think they're Kia commercials that have the uh, the three like life-size rats that drive around um, wearing really funky like gangster outfits and driving around in a Kia Soul. Love those spots. This sounds like it would work really, really well for that. Um, 
Yeah, but tons of edit points. Um, it had a, a stupidly simple melody, but very memorable. Um, it did all the right stuff. It built and then edit point, drop back down and build, edit point, drop back down. Again, I want to repeat what I, who was that? I think it might have been Annie Colvin, I think maybe said that. Yeah, it was Annie Colvin. She works on trailers. And I had her on a paddle, a panel on, uh, had her on a paddle, uh, on a surfboard, uh, I think on Thursday or Friday. Uh, and she said that her editors, that sometimes she's got 10 or 15 editors working on different trailers at a time. And she's got editors that will look at a piece of music waveform. And if it's a plateau, you know, just straight across and they don't see a lot of peaks and valleys, they will not even hit the play button and they will just go to the next piece. Interesting, huh? Um, so this one clearly uh, had peaks and valleys. Okay, we're moving on to... Oh, somebody asked about scene changes, and I want to address that. A scene change means um, if you're scoring a film, even just five minutes of a film, and there are three different scenes that happen within those five minutes. Um, Let's say that one, uh, the first scene is somebody, husband and wife driving in a car. Second scene might be the people at the house that they're going to having a fight in the kitchen before the guests get there. And the third scene might be um, other friends of theirs that are flying in for this you know, 30th anniversary party and they're stuck at an airport. Each of those scenes would have a different piece of music. And so the person composing the score would have to write a different piece of score for each of those scenes, unless, of course, they used um, a cue, like the airport thing might have some sort of background music. Actually, you know, airport scene might actually have a song playing in the background that is about traveling. Uh, the car scene, who knows what that would have. Um, and, and the kitchen scene could be you know, the, somebody fighting in the kitchen before the guests get there would probably be scored. It could be orchestral score, it could be hybrid, could be fully electronic. But in any case, it's three different pieces of music. But let's say that all three of them were scored, each section of score would be different because the scenes are different. So sometimes people who are new to the business want to show off their chops. This is what a great composer I am. And in a three minute piece of instrumental, music, which is supposed to be a, a cue, let's say, um, they will go through three different scene changes, uh, like three different movements in a piece of classical music. Doesn't work for anybody because it says three different things. It has three different emotions, uh, could be three different melodies, three different complements of instruments, all these different things that can change. You want to do cues that are one thing from top to bottom, okay? One mood, one emotion from beginning to end, and they, it doesn't have any scene changes. And it's probably just stuck on one little instrumental motif that repeats over and over, and the um, instrumentation that it starts out simple, adds another, you know, after four bars, then another instrument comes in, another four bars, yet another instrument comes in, starts to get to a crescendo, then drops back down to a breakdown, and then rebuilds again. It's always that, generally, again, their rules are made to be broken, but generally it's that same melodic motif, repeated, 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 boom, repeated, 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 layered, 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 and then boom, big crescendo to a buttoned or stinger ending on the end. Um, Okay, this one is called Surf Dance, and it is surf rock is the genre. And Adonis says, surf music has some very specific traits to sound that make it sound authentic. Fender guitars, spring reverb, etc. It's a genre that guitar players, yet again, have an edge over everyone else. Listening to surf bands gives us a good idea, uh, a very good idea of the drum beats, the melodies, and the overall vibe of surf rock. And here's a really um, important point that he brings up. Do not attempt this genre if your reference is only the Beach Boys. Dig deeper and seek authenticity. So yeah, you know, and Dick Dale, I think, is probably the father of surf rock. So go back to 
um, Dick Dale. I'm trying to think of some other big surf rock guys from back in the late 50s, early 60s. But uh, certainly there were several that were big in the genre before the Beach Boys. So let us listen. Nope, got to go back page, get the title. This is called Surf Dance. Nope. There. This is called Surf Dance. <laughs> repetitive, but yet it doesn't really lose your interest. It's always forward moving. So, you know what? That brings up a good point. That was what I would call a buttoned ending versus a stinger ending. And a stinger ending is pretty similar to a buttoned ending, but in my opinion, other people might phrase it differently. A stinger ending is a little more of a ta-da. You know, it, it could be played just by itself. Just the last note, just the ending could be played as a stinger for scene change or transitions or something. Uh, I'm going to go backwards a little bit on this one. So listen, this one just hits the last chord and lets it ring out. That's more what I would classify as a button ending. Button ending. I'm never sure if it's buttoned or button. Somebody will correct me, and there are probably several opinions on that. Um, I just saw Russell asked a question before. I think he's referring to my email that went out with the new batch of listings this morning where I announced the dates of the road rally. Um, it is November 5th through the 8th in Los Angeles. And no, we can't bring the road rally to your town. Everybody says, why don't you do one where I live? Why don't you do one in Europe, Michael? Um, we have a hundred different speakers, panelists, mentors, what have you. If we had to fly a hundred people to Chicago or Dallas or Poland or Singapore, or wherever. That's a hundred plane flights, not to mention probably four nights of hotel rooms for a hundred people. So figure, you know, 130 bucks a night or something for hotel rooms times, uh, let's do a little math, quick math, because I don't want to suck your time, uh, take you off the music thing, but let's say we've got uh, including my staff, let's say we've got like 110 people times $130 a night. That's $14,000 a night times four nights, $57,200 just for the airfare. And now let's do, I mean, just for the hotel rooms. Um, and now let's say we spend $500 because I'm not sure if we're going to wherever, but you know, within the continental United States, I'd say 500 bucks probably would well cover the airfare. So $500 times 110, that would be another $55,000. So we're talking just to get the speakers and panelists there, 
um, and the taxi staff and just get them there and put them in hotel rooms. Forget food, forget anything else. Um, we're talking 55000 plus 57000 so that's what, $112,000. Would the road rally be free for two people each? No. The road rally would be like 500 bucks a ticket or something. So there you go. That's why we do it in Los Angeles, because we can bring you an incredible event for free. You know what? Suck it up. Come to LA. It's a life-changing event. Most of our successful members have been to the road rally. They've networked with other people. They've built friendships that are going to last a lifetime. They've met collaborators in many other genres. Look, I mean, just uh, on this thing alone, Adonis has like three different people he's collaborated with, uh, at least three out of the 10 um, cues that I'm playing this week. And he met those people either on the taxi forum or at the taxi road rally, probably met them on the forum and then sealed the deal at the road rally. Uh, and he comes from um, Cyprus, 8,000 miles away. Talk about dedication. Did it pay off? Yes. Yes. I feel like I'm uh, selling something on an infomercial, but you know what? Anybody who's been to a road rally will tell you it's a, a do not miss event. It changes lives. That is not hype. That is truth. Um, Brent Max set says, or you could go to the Hawaii Songwriting Festival. Way affordable. Plug, plug. Yes, the festival is affordable. And it was wonderful. And I had a great time. It was great seeing you, Brent. Um, airfare to, to from L.A. to the Big Island. It's like $750 expensive. Why do they charge so much? And then they put you on an airplane that only has the ceiling mounted um, movie screen with like one movie and two half hour sitcoms for the whole flight. Uh, come on. They got to do better than that. And not that it was the Hawaii Songwriting Festival's fault. That was the fault of American Airlines. Um, Richard Charles, shuttle straight from airport to the hotel. That's true. For the road rally, we do it at a really nice airport hotel that is like, you know, maybe not a Four Seasons, but it's a really nice hotel that treats our members like gold. Everybody gets great rooms, and it's about a three-minute shuttle ride from LAX, and it's a free shuttle. So what do you save on? Four or five days of rental car. So that alone is a big savings. Um <laughs> Russell says, really, the trials and tribulations of the jet-setting Michael Lasko. Um, do you know, I used to fly all the time. Uh, I was out there pounding pavement uh, for taxi uh, all the time. There's nothing glamorous about it. I did rack up a million miles on Continental, which is now United. So I got a gold card for life. Um, and that is a nice benefit because it gets me a lot of upgrades for free without using mileage or anything. Couldn't use it on American uh, going out to the Big Island. But I got to tell you, um, Big Island, all I saw was the ride from the airport to the hotel, which was about 35 minutes. If you ever get a chance to go to the Big Island, at least the Kona Coast, which is what I saw, amazing looking. Do you know they've got a mountain out there that is almost 14,000 feet high above the water? Um, I mean, the Rockies are like nine or 10,000, maybe 11,000 feet, right? So they've got an island in the I mean, a mountain in the middle of the Pacific that for six months of the year has snow on it. So you could surf in the morning and ski in the afternoon on a Hawaiian island. That's cool. All right, last track. Um, this one is called Wrong Assumption. Um, and it's cinematic rock. And Adonis says, cinematic rock cues generally have a dark and foreboding quality. I've got to hand it to him. For a guy who, you know, English is his second language, the fact that he used foreboding, yay. That's, that's an accomplishment because I think I just learned that word like a month ago. Uh, foreboding quality that builds in intensity as the cue progresses, which is another thing that cues should often do. Based on a repeating guitar riff and rock elements, uh, uh, instrumentation, bass, drums, keyboards, etc., uh, the buildup should be relentless until the arrival of a climactic end. So there you go. Let's have a listen to Adonis Electris's track, Wrong Assumption. Q, I mean.
All right, that one was called Wrong Assumption. That was Cinematic Rock. Um, that's funny. Somebody said it was uh, 90s rock, I think. And I tend to agree with that. It, you know, it's funny. I got a little education right before the show today. We were uh, working on a listing that was somebody looking for contemporary. I think it was for Dispatch. And, and um, it's a publisher that's looking for contemporary rock stuff. And the references um, almost felt like EDM to me. And I went in, I talked to Anthony and Nick about it, and they said, hey, you know, that's, that's the way it's going. But like, I think Muse was one of the references. Can't remember who the other two were. But rock, record labels aren't signing a lot of rock. Radio's not playing a lot of rock right now. And the rock that does make it to radio on stations like K-Rock here in L.A., um, apparently... Uh, is getting more commercial, uh, you know, almost has like a pop um, production quality to it. So things change. Um, uh, old Scorpions. Contemporary Stadium Rock is really leaning uh, EDM. Okay. Anyway, um, first of all, I want to I want to say that once again, Adonis Electris is one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. He, he is a genuine soul. When this guy tells you something, it's always true. He's just a reliable, good, honest guy who loves his family, works really, really hard at what he does. He loves what he does, um, and he lives like 8,000 miles away and is becoming very successful, you know, doing music for TV shows and some films. Uh, I mean, he does get some work over there, but he's getting more and more work over here. So you don't have to be in the United States to be successful getting your stuff in American TV. Um, and I think it's really cool that... Uh, his music, uh, he also earns royalties. Getting the stuff in American TV shows allows him to earn royalties in Canada, Finland, Mexico, Norway, UK, and France. Um, and again, you can hear these cues if you want to listen, um, not through my webcam microphone, if you want to hear them uh, with headphones on. Uh, SoundCloud.com Adonis, A-D-O-N-I-S underscore Aletras, A-L-E-T-R-A-S. And look for the file called Taxi TV, June 2015. And he was kind enough to take all this stuff and put it in its own little place so you guys could go check it out after the show. Um, very, very, very proud uh, of Adonis. Thank you, Adonis. I'm um, really grateful that he took the time to assemble this stuff to do on the show today. Um, and I saw Russell asked earlier, he said, when are you going to tell us about the secret sauce to getting um, tons of placements? I think he was referring again to um, the email I sent out this morning. I'm only going to disclose it at the road rally. I've probably mentioned maybe little bits and pieces of it, but the other day while I was moderating a panel um, in Hawaii, I brought something up 
and a music supervisor um, guy named, well, I'm not even going to tell you his name uh, because somebody's going to meet him here in Los Angeles and say, okay, what was it that Lasco said on that panel that made you comment? Anyway, he came up to me, I think he said something on the panel, then he came up to me privately afterwards and said, you know, he thanked me for doing a, a good job of moderating, but he said, that thing you brought up, he said, that was pure genius. Everybody should know that. And I realized that I've probably given out little bits and pieces of it, but it's just this idiotically simple thing. So many things in life are staring you right in the face all the time, and, and you don't notice them, you know, when they're staring you right in the face. It's, uh, they're ubiquitous, and they're around you all the time, so you maybe don't notice it. Anyway, this was something where, when I said it, the gentleman on the panel said, do you realize how many more placements people would get if they all just thought like that and did that? Something stupidly simple, really easy, um, and I'm just not going to tell you until the road rally. I will also tell you that I'm very excited. Um, I'm doing um, some interesting things this year for the road rally that I don't believe... Um, some of these have ever been done, and I'm sure that other people who put on large conferences that copy everything we do at the Road Rally will be copying it next year at their event. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about the Yeah, it's like six months away, and normally by now I start getting petrified and I start losing sleep. Uh, I can't remember the last time I felt this excited about some of the stuff that I'm coming up with for the Road Rally. Uh, so this is the year to be there. Um, Michael, at least tell us which session you are going to make the big reveal. Maybe it'll be in my opening speech, Russell. I don't know. Maybe it won't be. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I just know that when that music supervisor said that to me, I knew as I said it on the panel, I thought, doesn't everybody know this? But see, we're all around this stuff all the time. So, uh, and I brought that up on the panel. They were using terms... Um, I can't remember, but there was one of the terms that one of the supervisors um, spewed out, and I said, I'll bet 80% of the people in the room don't know. Many of the folks are Hawaiian natives, and they've been completely unexposed to film and television. Um, I I've met amazing, incredible Hawaiian musicians um, that really didn't even know what a copyright was, uh, or had never heard of you know, licensing their music. Um, there was one lady uh, who, her name was Lady Epo, and I met her probably two or three years ago. I was doing some one-to-one -one stuff at, at what was then called the Kauai Music Festival or Conference. Um, and Lady Epo is this very large, lovely, warm, wonderful Hawaiian lady. Just like if there was a postcard of Hawaii that didn't have a hula girl on it, maybe the hula girl's auntie, Lady Epo would be it. And she played me this piece of music that just blew me out of my chair. It was like, so incredibly wonderful. I think I said something like, that is one of my favorite pieces of music I've maybe ever heard in my lifetime. Did you write that by yourself? Or you know, do you still have the copyright in the master? And she looked at me and said, what? Copyright? Master? What are you talking about? And I said, well, who wrote it? She goes, we all did. And I said, "Who? what do you mean you all did? She said, we get together for um, picnics or barbecues on Sunday. We all bring our instruments and we just make stuff up. It's a community thing. We all do it together, and nobody's ever copyrighted this stuff. Nobody owns it. It's just part of who we are. And I thought, oh, my gosh. Uh, I mean, dear God. Um, uh, Dondi Bastone, a music supervisor that I know pretty well, um, did the movie uh, The Descendants. And I think he listened to like five to 10,000 pieces of Hawaiian music to pick the stuff. The, the entire movie uh, which was a really good movie, by the way. Um, had George Clooney and Shailene Woodley, who I, it was one of her earlier, if not her first films, and you could tell that kid was going to be a star. Um, she she stole the movie from George Clooney, frankly, but the whole movie was Hawaiian music, and um, Lady Ipo absolutely would have had that track in that film. It's just gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. But she didn't know what a copyright and a master were, so. I reminded the people on the panel that you can't just throw out industry terminology. You have to think about who your audience is. And the audience gave me a, a little round of applause or something like, yeah, thank you for remembering that. So um, anyway, I, I just had a great time um, 
I don't go to many conferences anymore, um, but I, I just love the people that go to this one. I love the people that put it on. Um, Charles Brotman, his wife, Joni, and their daughter, Julia, who is, wow, what a fantastic young lady. Anyway, had a great time seeing everybody there. Um, I've been to, I think, 11 out of 13 of them or something, and uh, I feel like uh, I've got this whole other family in the island. So there you go. Um, again, thank you, Adonis, for sending this stuff in. Um, and thank you all for watching. Next week, I will have um, Ronan Chris Murphy on the show, who's always been a big favorite. And we will see you then to talk engineering, production, and other fun stuff on next week's episode of Taxi TV. Bye, you guys.